Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Wolfram Eilenberger. Wolfram is an international best-selling author and philosopher. He's the founding editor of Philosophy Magazine. He is a he hosts a television program on the Swiss Public Broadcasting Network (SRF). He is also the author of many books, including Time of the Magicians, Wittgenstein, Benjamin, Cassier, Heidegger, and the Decade That Reinvented Philosophy. And that is the book that we talk about in this conversation. We kind of have the conversation really hovering around the central question of can we separate the ideas from the person, the art from the artist, which is a, a question I've asked on uh, different podcast episodes with different types of people. And so knowing he he wrote a book that is very uh you know, biographical in nature as he's looking at the profiles of these four uh, philosophers. I wanted to kind of see where, you know, he could fit that argument into um, the conversation. And and really that question is in the book. And so we talk about these four men, um, but then we also talk about many of their um, you know, pros and cons in terms of their ideas. We start the conversation by kind of setting that up about separating the ideas from the biography of someone. We talk about the embodied view versus a pursuit of eternal truths. We talk about how institutional changes have impacted how philosophy evolves in the modern era. Uh, um, in the middle of the conversation, we talk about some of the challenges with analytic philosophy pretty, pretty directly. We talk about why these four men didn't really write a a moral or ethical piece of work, at least uh, kind of straightforwardly. We obviously talk about uh, Martin Heidegger, talk about his relationship with Hannah Arndt. We talk about his uh, political, very dark political preferences. Um, We talk about Wittgenstein um, and why he is a, a genius. We also talk about seeing philosophy um, in football or soccer. Um, Wolfram has uh, a personal interest and even some professional uh, interest in football in Germany. And so we, he's written about this, you know, how do we look at philosophical concepts uh, in football? And we spend maybe the last 15 or 20 minutes uh, talking about that, which is also really, really nice because we, we end on this note of how do we have a philosophy that is applied that it's not just, you know, people writing papers and passing it around to each other. It's like, how do we how do we do philosophy? How do we have uh, philosophy in our everyday life, and how do we see that and and talk about that honestly? And so it was it was a great 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 conversation. Um, his book Time of the Magicians and his other books are are quite good. He's an excellent writer and really does a nice job of explaining the personalities, but then also the ideas in a, in a really nice, cohesive way. And so now I bring you Wolfram Eilenberger. I'm here with Wolfram Eilenberger. Wolfram, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, super excited to uh, talk to you about your book and philosophy and many of your ideas. So uh, thanks for that. And just uh, tell people who you are and what you do and some of the things you've written. My name is Wolfram Eilenberger. I'm a German writer and philosopher. I live in Berlin. And um, what I mainly do now for a living is to write books about philosophy, mainly the history of philosophy. I also host a TV program on philosophy and Swiss television. It's called Sternstunde Philosophie. And uh, and some years ago, I founded a magazine which is called Philosophy Magazine. And its mission was to, um, you know, build a bridge between academic philosophy and public discourse. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's still running, uh, but I had the feeling that after seven years, someone else should do it and, and uh, be the head of the magazine. And um, since the publication of this book that I guess we are going to talk about, uh, Time of the Magicians, uh, I'm basically a full-time writer and dedicate myself to that. Yeah, no, that's 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 wonderful. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, uh, the book is uh, Time of the Magicians, Wittgenstein, Benjamin Cassier, is that how you say it? Cassira mm-hmm. uh-huh. and uh, Heidegger and the decade that reinvented uh, philosophy. It's, you know, I'll tell you just a brief, brief story about this. This is a book I kept seeing uh, online and I'd see it as uh, recommendations. And then when I go in a bookstore, I'd see it and I'm like, yeah, I got to read this. I got to read this. And I just never got around to reading it. 
And, and then a friend of mine, he was like, you got to read it. And I said, okay, okay, okay. So I, I finally bought it. And then I think I bought it and it sat on my shelf for a couple of weeks because I was super busy. And then I was like, okay. And then one night I picked it up and I, I think I probably read it in like two days. I mean, it was just really good. And I was, I was actually sad that I did not read it earlier. Um, it's a, it's a great book and, uh, it had to have been very difficult to write because you're, you're these four guys and you're, you're staying kind of in one period, but, um, you know, just, they're, so prolific they have so much writing so many ideas um so it's really just well done um and it's a uh, it's a great book Thanks. so glad to hear it yeah um so i guess the the central question i want to we could i mean so it's just a lot right there's you know you could spend hours and i have on the podcast talking about one of these people much less four of them so i get when i was thinking about the conversation there's a question that i've asked a few different people at different points and i really would be curious for your ideas, especially in light of these guys, which is the central question of um, how can we understand a person um, and how can we understand who they are, but how can we also understand their ideas or their art as separate from that? And so um, this is a question that gets asked sometimes when people are some pretty awful people, right? Or they do some awful things, but it's like, yeah, but they still contribute to society in other ways. So it kind of just to simply put it, you know, how do we separate ideas from the biography of a person or can we not do that? And so I'll just kind of pitch that to you and we can get the ball rolling there. What are your just general loose thoughts uh, on that? Well, I think it's certainly a central topic of the book and uh, of the things that I do as a writer. And I'm my point out, you know, for a starter, that there are two traps. Uh, one is the reductive trap, so to speak, that you think or you would imagine that you would be able to reduce the ideas of one person, be it, a, be it, a, be it an artist or be it a writer, um, to its to her or his biography. I think that's a silly idea and it's always very dangerous and it has been done for many decades, actually, centuries in literary criticism and other areas. But the other trap and this is i think more of a common trap in contemporary philosophy especially if uh, you do it in an academic uh, uh, environment is just to say like heidegger for example did himself don't care about my life and my life is absolutely not important i could have been a you know a, a century a, a person of the 16th century or the 19th century or the 8th century uh, all that you should care about is my argument uh, and the things that i write and i think both of these approaches as it were are, are mistaken uh, fallacious and also they are i think an impoverished they, they impoverish our idea of what it means to be a thinking being. Mm -hmm. And the way that I approach these four magicians, as I call them, Kassira, Heidegger, Benjamin, and Wittgenstein, is that I thought of them of philosophers who do not only proclaim or profess their ideas, but embody them. Mm -hmm. For them, philosophy was not a career. It was not a profession. It was probably a calling, as we could say. Mm -hmm. uh, Berufung in German, very important word here. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also, and most importantly, a way of self-transformation to understand themselves better, to understand the craft of philosophy better, and to understand the value and importance of philosophy in their culture. And what is really peculiar about the time and place that these four magicians found themselves, as it were, found their voice was that it was in a time of extreme crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the end of the First World War. Uh, the two uh, major uh, German-speaking um, um, empires had fallen and it ceased to exist, the Hohenzollern and the Habsburger. And these men came from the experience of the war and basically had three questions on their mind. The first question is, who am I? after that experience, what I'm to do with myself after this. The second question, and that is an eternal question of philosophy, but it pops up at different times in different shapes and forms. What is philosophy? Like, what does it mean? Is it a science? Is it a creed? Is it a art? Uh, so what is it? What does it mean to do philosophy? And, and of course, the third point, and this is most important, what does philosophy do to myself? Mm -hmm. And what does it do my culture? And I think the, the book that I wrote tries to follow the trajectory of these four thinkers 
focusing on these three questions because I believe these questions were actually not always, not only always on their mind, but they were basically that the dynamic cent center of their existence. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. <clears throat> I think that it's, I, I, I think the, the dichotomy of saying like, well, it's, you know, the, the biography of a person isn't important or it's extremely important. I definitely think it's somewhere in the middle. I think that's, that's easy to say in a general sense, but it becomes very difficult in, in other ways when people do things objectionably. You mentioned this idea, which you just mentioned now about the, the embodied view and then the view of philosophy as these kind of, you know, pursuits of eternal truths, you know, how explain those two ideas and what, what you mean by those, those constructs. Well, I think there are, you know, at least two ways you could think uh, of when you think of philosophy. Um, and the first one is more of a platonic view, you could say. Um, philosophy is about argument. It's about eternal insights. And it's not dealing with the ephemeral uh, or with the, something that is situated in time and space, but with eternal ideas, truths, and arguments. And there's a second idea in philosophy that's probably not, they're not mutually exclusive, but there's a certain tension. And that is the idea of philosophy as self-transformation, mm -hmm. as an art of transforming your own existence by knowing yourself better and knowing other people better. So understanding yourself and the understanding uh, means being an active understanding that is a kind of a transformation of your own existence. And uh, in this sense, I would think that you know, most of academic philosophy, and especially analytic philosophy, as it is taught uh, uh, and done today, especially in the English speaking world, it's still a platonic idea of philosophy. Philosophy is about argument. It's about insights. Uh, it's about being right or wrong towards another argument. And these four thinkers had a different idea of what philosophy is. Uh, they thought of philosophy, I would argue, as mainly an art of self-transformation. Uh, and that is an art that is done with arguments, but not only by arguments, but also with storytelling, narratives, poetry, art. And, you know, we could talk a lot about these, the ways these four thinkers wrote, but what really stands out that they were not only great philosophers, they were all also great writers, they were mm -hmm. also great poets. So they had a very fine sense of what language means and language does to our thinking and, and to our culture. Mm. So the way they treat their language and the way they write is radically different from what is done today in academic philosophy. So I think this, this idea of philosophy as an art of self-transformation, it's still very important. It's still very much alive. Uh, and, you know, if you would think of a, of, of a 20, late 20th century person in the academic culture or in the popular culture in the US, I would say, for example, Susan Sontag had such an idea of herself as a thinker and intellectual, that it's really about self-transformation. She took that, I guess, from Benjamin, because she was a great reader of Benjamin and it was extremely important to her. But, but to understand, uh, you know, Wittgenstein as a human being or Heidegger as a human being or Benjamin as a human being, it is impossible uh, to neglect the crisis, uh, the fears, the challenges they had to meet as real living human beings, and then just jump to their philosophy. It's, it's dishonest. And it's also an, um, a, a way of not seeing their utterances for what they were. Mm. What is it about that that's lost, I guess, right? Because you're saying you're saying a few things, right? You're saying philosophy and how the they viewed it was this element of self-transformation that used ideas, that used arguments, that used rationality, which is what most people I think would uh, ascribe to philosophy proper. And yet they also believed in the power of art and narrative and music and poetry and many of these things. And now it seems um, as we've progressed through modernity, I know Heidegger, late Heidegger talked about the role of technology and things like that, but mm. as we progress through modernity, that seems to have become forgotten in many ways. So you have people in philosophical circles that will continue to do this tradition, which is, which is good, but 
it's not as much um, in in mainstream, I guess, culture in certain ways. Now, yourself is trying to do that with some of your programs and uh, folks like Simon Critchley, he does that. He tries to make it very accessible. But where do you think that got lost? Is that just a part of, of evolution of time and how we've gone through modernity, how we have a digital age? Or um, that seems to be kind of lost in this way where people view kind of in the general abstract of it philosophy as a self-transformation thing that uses narrative and art and poetry. But now it just seems kind of resigned to, you know, that's, you know, people sitting around, you know, kind of, uh, you know, postulating about this and this and very intellectual and cerebral. And it is that, and it can be that, but it wasn't that for these guys and their day. And I don't think it still is, but it seems in the general uh, culture of things, people kind of have that overall view of it. So, I mean, would you agree with that? And if so, how do we kind of get to that point in modern day? Well, I guess there are many, many ways to answer that question. I think the most sound and plausible one to me is that these reasons are mainly institutional and they have to do with the professionalization, is that the word? Uh, um, you know, becoming uh, philosopher becoming a profession. It has to do with the growth of universities and the way you have to teach uh, and convey what philosophy is at these universities. So I think the you know the, the parting of the ways in these terms was probably in the fifties, mm -hmm. when in the English speaking world there was a huge growth in university activity uh, in England and in the U.S. Philosophy departments became part of that, and philosophy at that time in the English speaking world understood itself you know, in a certain closeness to science, mm -hmm. uh, especially um, physics, mathematics, and logic. Um, and this has not to do with the, uh, you know, the center of philosophy. This has also to do with the economics of what you can teach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's much easier to give a logic course mm -hmm. or a course in argumentative strategies. It's easy. You can do it to everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. It does not require a personal relationship. It does not require the openness of dialogue that you can only find in one-to-one -one teaching situations. So I think, you know, at the point where the university became really a mass institution in the English speaking world and philosophy became part of that, philosophy also lost touch with its poetic foundation mm -hmm. and it became too much I think there's kind of a spell of philosophy being a science and wanting to be a science. This has always been a problem. But when you are in an institutional situation and you have to justify yourself, what, what is it that I'm doing? Who am I and why I'm useful to society? I think the main answer that has been given in the Anglo-American context was, was the Quinean answer. You know, we serve science. This is what we do. And this is why we are useful. And once you follow that LA, much is lost. And on the other hand, you know, I don't buy this idea that philosophers only right now live in the ivory tower, because at least mm -hmm. in Europe or in Germany, it's virtually impossible to open a newspaper, to listen to a radio program, uh, or even to watch TV, and not finding a philosopher speaking out on certain mm -hmm. things. Um, mm -hmm. So there's also, I think, a probably a, a difference in the European perspective of what mm -hmm. a philosopher is and the Anglo-American perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's definitely not what we see here. Uh, that's more of a rarity than a, than a commonality of sorts. Um, just on that, that last point about the institutional piece of it, do you feel that that's I'm not trying to make you choose sides here, but there was a push. In, <laughs> you, you, you're not right. You're so not. <laughs> there was a there, there was a push in that period towards you know the analytic tradition of philosophy, yes. um, and we moved away from continental. And again, I'm not trying to pick on analytic folks. I mean, there's plenty of really good thinkers that are in the analytic tradition. But do you feel that that was also kind of that movement within philosophy proper of this kind of very scientific and very procedural kind of way of doing this, trying to make it a very specific uh, science. Was that also kind of part of it? Because many, and I don't know about in, in Germany or in Europe, but in the United States, most, uh, to my understanding, most philosophy programs are analytic. Um, and, yes. and so, so what do you see that part fitting in there? 
Well, uh, certainly. I mean, it's, you know, uh, bashing analytic philosophy has become the favorite sport of any public philosopher or any (laughs) philosopher that speaks out in the public, uh, as far as I can see. And the first thing, you know, the first line of defense is always by the analytic philosophers. So what is it? What is analytic philosophy? We don't even know what Uh it is. We just do philosophy. Right, right, right. Uh, And my answer to that is, is always, but if you have to find a new a colleague for your department, you seem to know very well who uh, and who is not an analytic philosopher. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. doesn't seem too hard to find that out for you guys mm-hmm, who yeah. do it. So I think there's a lot of, you know, mauvaise foi and, 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 you know, silly defense of saying, oh, we don't even know what it is. We mm-hmm. just do philosophy. Mm-hmm. It's not true. Uh, it's an industry. It is a certain culture. It's also a network. And that network uh, is protecting itself. Mm. And I think it's protecting itself right now so much because it realizes its, its own emptiness right now. Mm. I think the analytic philosophy, the idea of doing such a thing, uh, it's by now, it's a dead research program. Mm-hmm. And people who do it are bored themselves. They have a hard time explaining to other people why they are doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they lose connections to almost any other traditional field that philosophy was in touch with, with say, history of arts, say, theology, uh, say psychiatry, uh, I could name ma- many more, you know. Uh, so if you ask now an a, a analytic philosopher, wh- now who are you in touch with, who you are talking to, they probably say cognitive science. Yeah. Uh, that will be their main answer. And the reason is very easy again here. It's follow the money. Uh, you know, there was a lot of money in cognitive science and they were seeking the money and they would go there. I think mm-hmm. not for the good of philosophy and not for the good of cognitive science. I mean, I... I I don't have the feeling that we will look back on the last 25 years of this coalition between cognitive science and philosophy and say, wow, what great things have been done in the last 25 years. No one believes that. Mm -hmm. No Mm -hmm. one that I know of, at least. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, you're not trying to push me in that direction. I think (laughs) we have to realize. And and if you talk to analytic philosophers, uh, you know, in private, they will also mostly agree with this. Like, this is over. And the question is, what do we do now? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, you know, in the context of the book, because the book is very much written in the spirit that this whole continental divide, this split between continental philosophy and analytic philosophy, it did not exist in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And by now, everyone will agree that the 1920s were a decade of, you know, unusual philosophical creativity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that we are right now possibly living in rather poor times when it comes to philosophical creativity, it has also to do with this sad and dry dominance of analytic philosophy all over the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would firmly agree with you about the kind of convergence of cognitive science and and analytic philosophy and that, you know, I've said kind of publicly that I think there's too much of an emphasis on rationality and cognition. And it's very important, um, but it, it starts to, I think, lose the essence, if you will, of what it means to be human. We're not just cognitive machines. We, we, we certainly have uh, many, many humans have, you know, high cognitive capacity, but it, it just, it, it makes it very sterile and, and very cold and, and I don't think complete. And, um, I do see that kind of alignment there. I have, but you see, I mean, if, if I can, if I can, yeah, yeah. you see, you, you touched an, an energy strain in myself here, uh, when you talk about that, but the thing is, for example, here in Berlin, that you have, you know, departments, um, who were quite diverse 20 years ago, and now they are basically an analytic monoculture. Mm. And then you have the situation that who goes to these courses? And then you have courses with seven, eight, nine people from Mm. these analytic philosophers. And then some other people give courses on political philosophy or, uh, you know, topics of broader interest. And they have 90, 100 people there in their courses. And here comes now the answer of the analytic philosophers. This is why this is only because we are more demanding. This Mm -hmm. is only because we do the real stuff. And that's not for everyone because, Mm -hmm. you know, we do real philosophy and what they do is kind of, I don't know, I would not call it philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, so the line of defense is, you know, no one is interested in us because we are so good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is a game played now in a lot of philosophy departments. And it's ridiculous. I mean, Mm -hmm. look at, look at the mirror and ask yourself, are you teaching anything that is of interest to more than a few people who have very, very limited scope, for example, in terms of history, philosophy, and speaking out on many topics. I mean, this, this, this mental phimosis 
that is created by analytic philosophy. It's a tragedy to philosophy, but it's also a tragedy to our culture, because I do think we need philosophers that are broadly instructed and they deal with the history of philosophy. And uh, I don't see this interest as nourished enough by a certain maybe caricature of what I have in mind when I talk about analytic mm -hmm. philosophy. Look, I, I love the passion and, and I definitely agree with you. And it's it's interesting because I, I talk to people and they'll kind of you know step around it or whatever, or they'll say the same thing. Well, we don't I don't really know what analytic philosophy is. I, I think your 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 uh your your comments here are are, are very, very, very um illuminating, if I may say that. I have a I hope they're not too controversial. No, no, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh maybe I don't hope. <laughs> <laughs> the um I have I have two questions here. Uh, you can decide which order you want to take them. Yes. So there's the moral question. What can we say about Wittgenstein, Heidegger, you know, all these four guys you talk about, about being motivated by moral passions or not, right? They, they, don't, they don't write about a traditional ethic system. Um, they do talk about it in, in roundabout ways, I think, but they seem to have in common this way of understanding um, you know, certain types of ethics, I guess, if you will, but they don't really touch it. They're, you know, doing ontology or they're doing other types of things. Mm -hmm. But what would you say are their moral passions, either personally and or in how their, their ideas are and if they're connected or separate? Um, the other question I was going to ask is some of their influences. So, you, you know, you can ask, mm -hmm. answer the first question first. But you see, maybe we can connect this with another problem uh, here in contemporary philosophy, because once you present yourself as someone who's not doing an analytic philosophy, you know, in a broader sense, people will think that you are either interested in literature or you have some political interests mm. uh, or ethical interests. Mm. So you're, you know, almost certainly falling into this trap of self-help, changing the mm -hmm. society mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting, uh, you know, um, about Wittgenstein, Heidegger, uh, Benjamin and Kassira, that they tried to avoid both, actually. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. none of them wrote in ethics. None of them was, you know, bluntly political. Uh, with Benjamin, we can argue, but none of them would ever join a party or would ever join a greater cause in that sense. We talk about Heidegger later. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I saw, I saw what you said, um, and, and, and you know, and I'm not saying, oh, this was just a mistake. I mean, there's, there's a certain inherent logic and, and what happened there. But, yeah. but I think you know, if you think of Heidegger, Benjamin, Wittgenstein, and Kassira, you have also paradigmatic examples of thinkers who were not trying to justify only what scientific you know, what science is and why science is such a good thing. And on the other hand, you had not idealists who would really like to save the world with the insights that they have. So they, and they are not self-helpers and they are not prophets of a happy, uh, easy life. They won't tell you what to do. Uh, and no one does that in mm -hmm. philosophy, but certainly these guys won't. So I think they also embody an idea of what philosophy can be and not only embodied, but as a, as a, as a way of speaking and a, a way of teaching and a, a way of being in dialogue with the tradition and other human beings that doesn't fall into the trap of either scientific or self-help philosophy. Hmm. Well, it's interesting about the, the political angle of this. So since we're here, we can talk about it. So let's start with the maybe easy one first. Uh, you don't talk about it too much in the book, but it is about Benjamin's kind of my understanding, you tell me, if, maybe I'm wrong on this, but is that he had a strong anti-ideological bent on things and was political. I mean, he did flirt with communism and Marxism uh, and that and not only that he did that, but that they were influential on his writing. So how much how much would you confidently say as much as you can know that it was an impact on his philosophy and his writing? I mean, you know, if you if you were a, 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 a politically awake person in the 1920s, uh, it's impossible not to be influenced by Marxist thought. You know, it's, it would be, you know, your duty <laughs> to mm -hmm. think about that and, mm -hmm. and be open to towards that. But Benjamin is an interesting case because, um, you know, he loved to put himself as a human being, but also in thinking in situations that were not to be solved, that were too complicated to be resolved. Uh, and I think 
communism uh, or Marxism, uh, we should rather say here, was for him attractive because it was so far away and so much detached from his own intuitions that he wrestled with it to challenge himself and trying to find some common ground, although he knew that this, this would, for him, probably be the most difficult task mm. to fulfill. And you can see in Benjamin, every time when he is in some comfort zone, uh, either existentially or as a thinker, he challenges himself with an impossible task. And in this sense, I would argue that you know, Marxism for Benjamin was the impossible task for him. And this is why it was so attractive to him, hmm. not because he found it very convincing. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't thought of it that way. That is interesting. So this is almost the challenge of it, essentially. Uh, yes. And, and, you know, with his, you know, deeply religious uh, 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 approach, for example, to language mm -hmm. and, and to culture as such, and, and, and the importance that he stresses on transcendence uh, and also, you know, what he kinds of shock, kind of, a, of an instantaneous awakening that you cannot bring about yourself, but that is brought about upon you. And then you have this idea of an idea of history, uh, which is systematic, which has an internal logic that will lead to an end, certainly. And then you, you see, you see a thinker like that and says, okay, this is, this is Marxism, how I get it. It's really at the other end of what I believe but it's there, it's powerful. So what do I do with it? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that was the attraction. And I'm not saying that it was in vain. Uh, if you could say, for example, the same of Sartre, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when he was uh, in his existentialist space, there was this idea that I become a socialist. You know, mm -hmm. everyone knows, and I still think everyone can understand today that, you know, uh, existentialism and Marxism is, is a perfect non-match. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting that someone tried. Uh, and in the same way, I think um, uh, Benjamin's philosophy of culture and Marxism is a perfect non-match. But it was uh, exactly because of that reason mm. that this tension was productive. Yeah, and I also think of Merleau-Ponty as well, who also had yeah, certain right. ideas about Marxism as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you think about humanism and terror and how he, you know, yeah, there's many... But this is, you know, in, in, the, late, in the late 40s and 50s in, in French, it's also a generational thing and mm -hmm. it's also an institutional thing in the higher educational institutions in france you know even foucault was part of the marxist party uh in, in his early youth so it was virtually impossible not to be in the know or part of the crowd right. and not be a communist at that time <laughs> right right uh so i mean let, let's let's talk about heidegger so there's two questions i have here about heidegger mm -hmm. um <clears throat> Uh, we'll get to the Nazis in a minute. How much do you think about, um, I was having a conversation with, um, uh, Samantha Rose Hill, right? She, she mm -hmm. studies, she right. studies Hannah Arndt yes. and we talked about this and she, we we're just kind of thinking out loud and, and because Hannah and, and, and Heidegger were, uh, together at the same time when he was writing being in time, uh, mm -hmm. how much do you think, you know, that relationship influenced his writing on being in time was he she a type of muse for him how much is hannah in being in time or not at all or you know because that was a really special time for you know for both of them um and that's where he put out something uh you know i mean one of the greatest works of the 20th century H how much of that influence do you see from that personal relationship you have with her that is in being in time well Firstly, in purely chronological terms, I think Heidegger started writing the thing when Hannah Arendt was already in Heidelberg. So actually, um, she was not there in Marburg and she was not there in Freiburg. So if there is some kind of an impact you know, of this love affair on his own productivity, it's because he might have missed her. But she was not there while he was mm -hmm. writing it, uh, mm -hmm. which is also, you know, a kind of a motivation. Or, or um, maybe the exchange of ideas they had, right? I mean, yes. you can have exchange of ideas for years and then you start to put pen to paper after the person is gone. Right, right. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Not, not to take any, anything away of Hannah Arendt. I would be the last person to do that. But she was, you know, 18, 19, 20 at the time. Sure. So um, there, were, there was an impact, an existential impact uh, in terms of what it means to fall in love eventually. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and to leave your own house, uh, uh, your own, uh, your own skull, and be 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 aware that there might be another human being that is as important to me as I am important to myself. Mm -hmm. um, Heidegger, I think, never got around that, yeah. but 
Arendt came very close to that effect. So for him, it was, I think, an existential insight that there can be such a relationship. And it was a special relationship. Now, you know, someone like Samantha, uh, uh, he, she might tell you, and she knows better that, and this is true, Heidegger wrote a lot of letters and he yeah. explained to a lot of women things like that. So mm. he made everybody feel very special. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's a good argument to be made that these two meant something to each other that was larger than themselves, as Hannah Arendt said. It's certainly true for Hannah Arendt, but it's also to some part true of Heidegger. So I would not, you know, in, in terms of explaining this creative explosion that Sign and Side was for him, I'm writing it down more or less in, in 10, 10 months or so, I would not overestimate the influence that Arendt had on him. But as a thinker and as a human being, I think the Arendtian event, if you want, uh, changed something in him. Uh, and that change can also be seen in sign and sight at times, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, I think that's, the, I think that's, that's fair to say based on what we know, maybe it was more, maybe it was less, but from what we know, it seems fair. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like every time I bring up Heidegger, this comes up, but I'll be curious for your perspective. I mean, I guess most people, um, maybe you can, if you, if you, if you're able to give some of the context of that, um, I have my way of explaining, um, Heidegger's uh, joining the Nazi party. I guess the thing that always gives people, uh, a, myself included, a really hard time about it is that he never really renounced it um, explicitly to my knowledge. He never, even after the war, he never said, hey, I got it wrong or, you know, they went too far or, you know, in whichever way he would say it. I know, I know he became very, you know, kind of a you know, like a hermit, right? He's very secluded out in the black forest, but he wasn't doing a lot of public stuff anyways. But I mean, how do we just, I guess the first question is why at the time, um, why best, you know, why did he decide to, to join this party in 30, whatever it was two, three, I'm forgetting. And after all the horrible things that, that were done, why did he not kind of explicitly say this was wrong and I regret doing it? I mean, what do you kind of make of his involvement politically? Well, you know, this is very complicated uh, and very uh, loaded stuff. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's, I think there are three ways to go about. There's a psychological explanation, there's a cultural explanation, and there's a philosophical explanation. Okay. The psychological, and, and neither of them is fully sufficient. And even sure. if you take the three of them together, there is still something lacking, something mm -hmm. that is to be understood or not to be understood, because after all, it's it's somewhat of a tragedy, not only to German speaking philosophy, but to philosophy as such, that probably the, the most gifted thinker of the 20th century uh, became a member of the National Socialist Party in Germany. I mean, this is, it's, this is something that still should give us reason to pause today when course, we think about yeah. what philosophy is mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and what it does to ourselves uh, as human beings. But, the psychological explanation, I think, is, is very simple. Heidegger was a very small character and a very small human being. He, he had a great gift. Uh, he was a great thinker. But whenever he smelled power, influence, admiration, he would go for it. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, that, that was the leading, uh, that was the goldmine to follow. So in that sense, I think for him, there was really something he wanted to be in many ways, a much greater human being than he was. He wanted to have more influence, more power. He liked that stuff. He liked also to dominate other people, uh, to be admired by them. And so, so this is purely psychological reason. A very small human being seeing a chance of doing something that he always dreamt of. And that is also true about Heidegger. So this is one explanation. It's, it's not everything. The second one is the cultural explanation is that Heidegger was not at all alone in this, not even in the intellectual world. And the way Heidegger saw things from a you know, world politics point of view was that there is a kind of a quandary of, or a dilemma for German speaking culture, which is either you have communism or you have the American civilization with capitalism. And they were looking in these years, many of them, many philosophers, many intellectuals, for, as it were, a third way an alternative, mm -hmm. not to have a communist system, not to have a capitalist system, but what they thought of as a third way. And Heidegger at some point uh, thought that, you know, 
national national socialism might be that as a movement, not as a party, not as an ideology, but the energy of it mm. might lead to something that would create this alternative that he dreamt of uh, in cultural terms. And and this was, I, I think he had a hunch that this could, you know, Hitler could stand for that. Uh, of course, mistakenly so, but he was not the only one who, who made that mistake uh, in, in, say, 1931, 1932, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because things were rather dire uh, economically, culturally yeah. uh, in Germany at that time. So, so something had to happen. Some, you know, he was looking for an opening and mm-hmm. He would basically take any opening he could find. And at that time, it was Hitler. Does that excuse what he did? No, of course not. But I think this is the cultural reason. And the philosophical reason, of course, is that, yes, there is, I think, in the way that he thinks about culture uh, and the way that uh, Western culture as such developed, there is uh, probably, an, I think, an internal inherent anti-Semitism that is at the very heart of some of his ideas, interpretations of the way culture has taken, at least for four centuries before him. And so so there was also, I guess, in this sense, an idea that he he would be in a good place to be with the Nazis Mm. due to some of the anti-Semitism that was cultivated around him, especially by his wife, uh, but also by his fellow uh, milieu, also by the Catholicism that was deeply uh, inside him. Mm-hmm. So there are many reasons uh, for that. And then he made that move. Uh, one should also say, and this is not um, to diminish uh, uh, the greatness of, of that faulty move, uh, that he, you know, after, I guess, 18 months, I, I'm not sure if it was 16 or 18 months, he basically stepped down um, um, from, from his position. Uh, he never uh, was uh, any way active for the party after that anymore. Um, so he did realize, if we talk about this uh, third way as an alternative between communism and, uh, and American capitalism, that this was not what he was looking for, that this was a horrific choice of his. Uh, he, he came very, I think, soon um, to that conclusion. And then you ask, and this is probably, I think, the question, that at least that is least interesting to me, but from a human point is, is very interesting. Why did he never apologize? Uh, why did he never speak out on this publicly, or at least I would say explicitly, uh, which is a difference. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that Heidegger did not, you know, he believed, he thought of himself as a great thinker and maybe even more than a human being, but a savior for a culture. Mm-hmm. And these human beings, uh, they make great choices. And by doing great choices, they also commit great mistakes. But Heidegger did not think of himself as a person who would, as it were, be allowed to apologize for that, because an apology would be, paradoxically speaking, much too small of a thing Mm. uh, to do. And to think, oh, I apologize and everything is good. I mean, we all feel that this is too little, whatever you do. You know, you apologize and then, okay. Uh, now I said I made a mistake. I think Heidegger was clearly aware of the fact that he made a mistake. But, you know, it's a kind of a pride, but also a philosophical conviction that you're not allowed to apologize for a mistake like that. You have to leave it like it, like it is. It, it would have meant a lot of, you know, it would have meant a lot to a lot of people if he would have spoken out that way. Uh, and, but that was not, you know, that's not how how he rolls. He does not care about what other people think of him and he would not make life easier for them uh, just by saying, I apologize. He was in a very shrewd sense, true to his own principle, principles as a philosopher by not doing so. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. I, I've never heard someone articulate that way and I, I could see that. I mean, I... I hope my English was, uh, you know, no, no, refined no, enough. No, but this, 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 this idea, this idea that you're not allowed to apologize for a mistake like that, I think that it, it's not only shallow. There is possibly some depth in a stance like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I could, I could definitely see it. Um, I, it does. I think from right, you're saying from a human perspective, it does leave many folks kind of wanting for more. It's like you know, this is literally one of the you know the worst things in the modern era that's happened and you know it's, it, the fact that nothing was said about it but I, I i think the perspective based on understanding him and how he saw philosophy is is uh important 
I have uh, two, two, uh, two, I guess, uh, topics here to, to kind of end with. Um, I don't want to leave out Wittgenstein. Um, you say early on, I think, that he, the Tractatus is a type of therapeutic contribution. Um, and that, um, you know, there's, there's so many things about that, that work. I guess the, just a general question I have is, you know, obviously, you know, Wittgenstein is a terribly interesting person in terms of he was very wealthy and sold it all. And, you know, just was a, he just went on to be a, a school teacher by choice and live a very simple life. And he was very suicidal at many points. I think three or four of his siblings committed suicide. I mean, there's just a lot of, brothers. yeah, a lot of darkness there. He sort of kind of flirted with Catholicism. I don't think he was a Catholic, but he was not um, uh, shy about it. I think he had some fondness of some of it. I, guess, I think is right. But um, I, I would call it Christianity, not necessarily Catholicism. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. And um, I guess just what was what was it for you in your mind that just kind of makes him a genius? I mean, what is it about the Tractatus that's so brilliant, and what is it about his philosophy and who he was that just makes him so brilliant? Well. I mean, what makes Messi so brilliant? You know, I, I, I could try to answer that question, but uh, the, the best answer I could give you, just look at the YouTube video and you will not ask yourself that. <laughs> in that sense, I would say, you know, take some Wittgenstein and have a look at it. And mm -hmm. I guess that's the answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's ob somewhat too obvious uh, to mm -hmm. explain it. Once you explain, you're losing, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not willing to explain that. If you, if you can see the greatness of the philosophical investigations, uh, then so be it, but I'm not doing any explaining here. Um, and, <laughs> you know, yeah, no, I, I'll, I totally I'll agree with you. To get my point. And, and you know what is what is really distinctive, and I think much overlooked, uh, or has been for a while, uh, been overlooked by by the analytical take on on the Tractatus, is that it's a work of poetry, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a work of ethics, a work of non-ethics, but of ethics non nonetheless, uh, and. What is so beautiful and I think internally brilliant about the Tractatus is not only the, you know, fine way of dealing with certain arguments in a, in a formal way, but also the almost impossible mixture of avant-garde poetry, mm -hmm. uh, a certain culture of aphorisms uh, mm -hmm. and pure formal logic. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's again a, a hybrid uh, you could see uh, in, in genre and style that is that is almost impossible what, when you think can it be done no it can't be done but Wittgenstein did it mm -hmm. uh, and it's one organic work it's not the case as some people claim that you know the foreword and the first lines and the last lines they are not part of that work they are and they are an organic part of that work mm -hmm. um, and and to to be able you know to to marry a cutting edge formal symbolisms in logic and the deep and proud uh, and rich tradition of Austrian avant-garde literature and poetry and melt that into one work uh, with a very, very deep approach to the deepest questions that human beings can have. Uh, that's, that's quite something. And then to claim, as he did, uh, not even being 30, that he basically it's still a question if he was ironic about that, that he solved all uh, of the major questions mm -hmm. in philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, saying that, but this only shows how little uh, has been done with it uh, by doing so. Um, that, that, is, that is great. And of course, what I particularly love about uh, the structure of the Tractatus, as far as I can uh, understand and conceive it, it's, it's like a magical trick. It's like one of these magicians. If you have a table and you have... Um, you know, uh, the glasses uh, and the meal and everything. And then you have the tablecloth and the magician just puts one thing uh, away, namely the table tablecloth, but the, the glasses are supposed to still stand. And so does the meal. So it's uh, uh, this, this self-refutiating uh, aspect of the Tractatus while still being consistent and coherent. It's just a great feat of, of, of the human mind. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's, I've read it so many times and every time I read it, I'm always blown away. Like it's the first time it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. I, I, I want to ask you about this cause I, you know, so we talked a lot about philosophy and, and about these philosophers, but you know, I know one of the interest and in some of the, the, the work that you do is, um, is with, uh, German football. 
uh, or mm. soccer, as as the as people in the United States call it. Um, um, Stay with football, shall we? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, football is that's what I usually know it as. So um, maybe just we can just chat about this, you know, uh, briefly, but. Yes. Um, just kind of uh, what you do with with uh, with football, and where do you see are some parallels with um, kind of the applied sense of like there's many things you can learn from sports, the world of sport, and there's many things you can learn from football about yes. many many ideas. And so, how do you how did you kind of get into this and what you do, and then how do you kind of bridge some of those things? Well, no, there's there's a bio purely biographical reason for it. Uh, I, I really was into football. I was not so bad at it. Uh, I tried to become a professional player and um, it was not, you know, totally impossible to think that I might have the chance to do that. I wasn't good enough in the end, but yeah. uh, biographically speaking, it was a big thing for me. And I really understood, I think, much of myself and other human beings by, by playing soccer uh, in such an intensive way. Um, from a philosophical point of view, no. And then I stopped doing soccer almost immediately and I started to do philosophy. And for me, it has been and it still is a kind of a biographical task to marry these two passions uh, mm -hmm. and see uh, how they can mutually enrich each other. But the other thing is, and I think this is truly interesting about uh, soccer, you know, soccer asks the impossible of human beings. And the impossible is this you are supposed to control a ball with an extremity that is utterly unsuited to do so, namely the leg. Mm -hmm. uh, and you should not only do this by yourself, but working together with 11 other human beings and then another 11 other human beings who try uh, to stop you from doing that. Mm -hmm. And what you, I think, can see when you watch a soccer game is you can see failure because mm -hmm. most of the things on a soccer pitch don't work. Mm -hmm. So you can basically observe 22 highly gifted, highly trained human beings being thrown into the openness and the, uh, of an event that they try co to control, but cannot control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not only beautiful, I think that's also philosophically uh, important because you can basically see, as it were, the thrownness of the human being in an mm -hmm. existential situation that is ontologically overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And how do we cope with that? So, you know, in German, there's this saying, Fußball ist unser Leben. Mm -hmm. Football is like our life is. Uh, it's just a saying, but there is something I think that rings true to me uh, in that, namely that it is the beauty of soccer. And that is not the case with basketball or ice hockey, not even with football, to to see people in the openness of an event, because you can see everything on a soccer pitch. There's mm -hmm. nothing hidden. There's an exposure there, for sure. Absolute, absolute exposure. And they try to solve a problem, and they're very good at it, but they won't do. They won't solve it. It's impossible to solve. Uh, and there's great beauty in watching this. And of course, in the development of trying to solve that problem that cannot be solved. Yeah, it, I, I really like the way you say that. It's 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 really good. I mean, I I again, I'm a big football fan. I, you know, I I watch it every week, and I always am struck by many of the things that you said, but also this concept or idea of how do you understand the kind of the phenomenology of space? Because so mm. much of what we understand on a, a football pitch is constructed by how we operate in space and how we navigate in space and how we how we look at the other in space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and many of the things that you're saying about this idea of control and failure but and then you have all the like kind of the you know the specifics right you know tactics and formation um but at the end of the day it's very simple i guess one question i have about this is is there's different brands of football, right? You have obviously in Germany, there's the German way. There is uh, La Liga in Spain. There is the Premier League in England, um, et cetera. What is it, I guess, specifically, you were kind of mentioning to it, that is, you know, when I watch the Bundesliga and I watch, or I watch the, the, the German national team, or even if I just see German players, um, you know, my, my team is uh, Real Madrid. So I, I've liked them since I was a kid. And I, I love, I love, uh, I love Tony Cruz. He's one of the best players for us. He's amazing. He's, he is the definition of efficient. Um, and he's, he's the engine. 
Um, but what is the say, German way of doing that? What is the German way of doing football? You know, here I would like really to stop you okay. because this metaphor of the German machine, the German tank, <laughs> La Mannschaft, you know, those, <laughs> those stereotypes were created in the 1920s, basically after the war. And uh -huh. they are basically war stereotypes put on nations, put on soccer teams. Uh -huh. uh, and the way you describe, for example, Tony Kroos, uh, whom I really adore deeply, and mm -hmm. I've written about uh, many mm -hmm. articles, mm -hmm. um, he is efficient, but he's not machine-like efficient. His efficiency is an efficiency of beauty, of mm -hmm. anticipation, of opening spaces that no one sees. That's something a machine cannot do. That's fair. Uh, yeah. The way he improvises in space and time uh, in such a perfect and elegant manner. I, you could say it's, you know, in economic terms, it's efficient, but it's much more than that. I think it's a generally aesthetic experience mm -hmm. and view of things in space that he has that few human beings mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. So I think we undersell Tony mm -hmm. Kroos and German soccer by calling it efficient. No, that, that, that's, that's definitely fair. I like that, that perspective. When, when I watch him play, I always, you know, I will joke, I'll say, you know, he can, he can cross a ball, you know, 60 meters or whatever, and it lands right, right at the person's foot. There's a, there's almost a poetry to it, right? It's a, he, he just puts the GPS and it's like, boom, right there at the person's, you know, feet. But I guess, so, so again, to that point, right, is what would you say is, is I guess the German way? I mean, I'll just say this. I mean, Germans, the German football, the national team, I mean, since I've been alive, has always been, for the most part, third place game or better every four years in the World Cup. They're just right. always there. They're always consistent. Um, and even when you watch the Bundesliga, how they, how many of their teams operate, how they do their youth system, how they have their boards, how they sell players, how they buy players, and then on the pitch and how they do. Like, there's a certain style about that. What is it about that, that top down, I guess, works and how do they go about doing it uh, you know i think that it's basically determined like everything else by the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves uh, uh -huh. and there's this german myth of togetherness i mm -hmm. think one idea is that we really think of soccer as a team sport it's not a sport that is about individuals but about 11 human mm -hmm. beings so that is that is important and it's not the case with other soccer cultures. Um, the second thing is that I would think of the German soccer ideal as neue Sachlichkeit, you know, uh, in terms of aesthetics. It's, it should be functional. Uh, it should be beautiful. It should be clear. And there shouldn't be too many surprises. And what you really don't like is, you know, effects like showmanship uh, or, or, you know, doing things that are just for the public, but not for the game. So there's a soberness, uh, aesthetically speaking, about uh, German soccer, ideally, I think. And then there's also the idea, and this has to do probably with the metaphysics of the will that are very deeply entrenched in my culture, if you think you know, of Schopenhauer or Nietzsche, that you, by willing one does, you know, that really trying to win uh, and believing that you can do it and that the will can carry you very far because, you know, we are not the most beautiful people in the world, uh, probably not the most talented. Uh, and we think in soccer that we, we have to make up for it. And that's still a belief that is very strong. But it has changed, you know, if you think of the last 20 years in, in German soccer, it's a deeply multicultural team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we have players mm -hmm. like Özil, like Kadira, like Podolski, like Klose. So, um, you know, to, to, to try to describe German soccer nowadays mm -hmm. with these virtues, that's that's it's becoming an increasingly iffy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I did want to ask about the um, about the the idea of of that change within football, but then also more of the ideas of what you were talking about earlier about some of the the linkage, both with your own biography and then just in general of these philosophical ideas that you know, you're talking about the throne Heidegger's thrownness concept on the pitch. What I guess are some other philosophical concepts or ideas in your mind of how on the pitch or off or whatever that we can see in football, right? How do we, we talk about control. We talk about this yes. sense of failure, but what are some other deeply philosophical things we can understand when we watch or when people play uh, uh, football? 
well, you know, I, I, I might just answer with a title of a book by Richard Rorty that was very important to my uh, generation, maybe to yours too. It's Contingency, Irony, Solidarity. Mm. <laughs> Those are the three things you can see on a soccer pitch mm -hmm. every time. And I think to me, the philosophically most interesting thing is contingency. Uh, mm. uh, and the ball as such is a machine or an object of contingency. Um, and as I said, you know, and this is different from, and it's been many, many times said, um, if you try to control the ball with a hand, like in basketball, that can be done. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult, but it's mm -hmm. much easier. With the foot, it's impossible. No mm -hmm. one can do this. It's nothing to control. You can, you can fail better or worse, but mm -hmm. control you'll never have. Um, and and, and this, is, this is something that, that people create a game that creates more contingency constantly that they can handle. I think that's very beautiful. Uh, and the other thing is also, and this is, this is a philosophical aspect of soccer that is largely overseen, I think, it's the nothingness of, of soccer, because mm. nothing ever happens. You know? mm. And I think still to the US spectator, they don't understand how anyone can be excited by a game that is that boring, right, you know, right. and yeah. where the decisive uh, event is that rare, you know, it rarely happens. There's a goal, oh God, one goal in one game. How mm -hmm. can you follow a sports like that? Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you, if you think of the, so to speak, of the rhythm of soccer, it's, it's, it's like a soup that is bubbling uh, and boiling, but it, it's very slow uh, and nothing ever happens. And then you have this eruption like a volcano. At one time, something mm -hmm. happens. So it's a specific kind of being attentive to something. Uh, that is created in soccer. And I think the reason that soccer still is not really working in the US is that the US audience is just, uh, you know, they expect more action that they will get from this game. Well, the nothingness piece is super interesting. I've never thought of it that way. And that makes many much intuitive sense, actually. Um, I guess the kind of connected with that is, is that so many cultures and if you will i don't want to say civilizations but so many people around the world really have this you know i mean soccer is a is a religion for them i mean it's 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 so much about them it's an identity you, know, you go to south america um, you go to different parts of africa you go to obviously you know europe i mean it's part of who they are it's a part of their identity how is that possible how is that possible that one game what are the components of it that are truly, you know, cross-cultural, if you will? I mean, how could that be, right? How could that be that this one game is pooling not just the tactics and the, and the formation and all of the skill, but, but the raw emotion out of it? You, see, you don't see that with, with other sports in that way. And what do you think is, is about that? Well, I mean, if I would have a critical perspective on it, it's the answer is colonialism, my friend. Uh, mm. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. People got used to this. Uh, the British Empire did it. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have it. Um, mm. And that's all. And if it would have been field hockey, mm. <laughs> we will yeah. love field hockey. Maybe there is no, you know, there is no secret sauce uh, there. It's mm. just purely political. Mm. That there could be, that's one answer. But, but uh, I think, uh, um, and this is FIFA ideology 101, it's still a very simple game. And you mm. do not need much mm. to understand it, to play it, uh, uh, or, or to be excited by it. Uh, so it's, it's still simple rules. It's very much in the open. Uh, the exposure is extreme. It's easy on the eye. The mm. pace is good for the eye. Mm. Um, you can follow everything. Uh, and... I think what is especially beautiful about soccer, aesthetically speaking, is, you know, if you have a long pass or you have a combination, the excitement created by the anticipation of the event mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. supposed to follow, mm -hmm. it's unique in soccer. You don't have that in basketball mm -hmm. or ice hockey mm -hmm. because it's too fast. But mm -hmm. here you can really go, wow, now it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it rarely ever happens. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's this godlike moment of the goal that is always like a gift that is not made by humans, but mm -hmm. it comes up on you. Uh, so, but you see, I'm, I'm speaking uh, like a child and like a fan, which I am. <laughs> well, look, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your time. Uh, the book is Time of the Magicians. Um, you've written a few other books after this. So where can people find this book and, and your other books and where to find you online and all those good places? 
Well, um, there's a book that I wrote now about the 1930s about Hannah Arendt, Simone de Beauvoir, Simone Weil, and Ayn Rand. Oh, uh, it's kind of a f uh, next part of this project of writing, say, an alternative history of the 20th century by focusing on philosophers who were not academic philosophers, but tried to embody their ideas in real life. Um, and uh, that's that's what will be out, I think, in the US next year. Nice. Uh, the title nice. will, be, will be The Visionaries. Uh -huh. um, and yes, uh, otherwise I'm on Twitter, I guess, uh, more than I should be. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's true <laughs> for all of us. That's true for uh, all of us. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I hope that people understand that this is not, not an academic book. It's really a book for people who try to understand what philosophy can do to your life. Um, and those are not only good things. Uh, I mean, there is dark energy in philosophy. And um, the person that we spoke of, uh, Heidegger, is, is, is a, mm -hmm. a very telling example uh, mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, you know, much, much thanks to you, Wolfram. This has uh, been so much fun. And so uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy that we, we got to talk. So. Okay. Thanks right, for thank your patience you. and your time and your interest. Of Bye -bye. course. Of course.